With us now entering an entirely new arc, we don't really have any sort of opening sequence or anything like that. Rather, we move right into episode 29's title, Soldiers, which I think has a couple of different interpretations. First off, the obvious. There's the soldier warrior split in Reiner and Berthold that we'd see very, very explicitly in this episode. So with the title of Soldiers, it just neatly describes them actively playing a soldier. Much more on this in a minute though. On a somewhat similar note, I think it could also be referencing the Emir Reiner scene we see and how both realize that they might not exactly be who they think they are. With Emir revealing that she can read Marley in writing, and Reiner accidentally confirming that he even knows what Herring is. So again, both are sort of playing soldier right now. Also, there's the angle of Emir calling out a story of her playing soldier, so there's also that. And finally, we of course have the very literal interpretation of Lion and the others, with each and every one of them fighting to their very, very last breath. Plenty more on all these as we get to them, though. Moving into the episode itself, we open right where we left off, with Zeke still chilling on the wall and summoning a whole bunch more titans upon Utgard. With us also seeing the titans attacking each other, immediately cluing us in that these are not entirely normal titans, and that they're rather being affected by some other power. Alternatively, just like Connie's mom who seemed to be able to speak, this might be another case of a titan, for one reason or another, still having some of their human instincts bleed over. But point is, clearly the Beast Titan is pulling some shenanigans here. Though before we actually get to fighting them, we return to two hours earlier, at which point we are just absolutely showered in hints about the truth of the outside world. First off, as we'd see in the very very next episode, Paradis has some very very harsh winters, clearly implying that we are quite a ways from the equator and more importantly, the coffee belt. But then one of the very first things we see here is a coffee grinder, cups and pots. Something that we'd later learn was Zeke's while they were camping out here. So when the soldiers say that they don't even know what this liquid is, it's because, oh god bless their poor souls, they have never had coffee. So again, while this may seem obvious in hindsight, currently we are operating in a purely fantasy world and the world of Attack on Titan as we knew it was only the walls and the bit of land around them from where the Titans came. But one subtle hint at a time, we are slowly adding them up to uncover the true scale of this world. So if you were paying extra close attention, within the space of like 3 seconds, we were just introduced to a whole nother climate altogether. And on a similar note, they then find the bottle of alcohol but can't read the label because unbeknownst to them, it is Marley in writing. And I do admit this is very much me overanalyzing, but notice Reiner's face, because to me, that seems like worry. Worry that Zeke made a huge slip up by just leaving all of this stuff laying around. And worry that they might have even left behind some technology that Parody just simply should not possess. Though before we follow up with that, Historia, or still Krista, then speaks up, proposing that maybe the wall isn't breached after all. And yet again, remember old Chekhov. We as the viewers have already seen Hannes ride around the wall, and they never found a breach, right? Well, Astoria suddenly mentioning it here is just a in-universe way of reminding us as the viewers that this is not like Shiganshin or Trost. It is deliberately telling us that, yes, there is in fact no breach. That uneasy music in the background perfectly accompanying the tenseness and intrigue of the situation. <laughs> and another case of the series just reminding us about what's going on here is Connie talking about how his village might have been destroyed but deliberately saying that at least everyone got out as there was no blood. It is the usual question of why would this dialogue be written in if it wasn't referring to something specific. And in this case, we of course know that they did get out, only, you know, not in human form. And also, in classic Attack on Titan fashion, notice the cheeky shot of Reiner and Berthold just so happening to loom over him as he describes all of this. Though the super interesting stuff here comes from when Connie mentions the Titan that reminded him of his mom. Which number one, just like with Ragako itself, just plants the idea in our minds that yes, this was in fact his mother and that yes, humans can turn into titans, but more importantly too, does a great job of characterizing Emir. She suddenly breaks the tension by just brazenly laughing at everything Connie is saying, straight up calling him dumb for believing something as ridiculous as his mom being a titan. Now, on the face of it, this just seems super condescending and rude, right? But no, as we'd see many, many times later on, this is her form of protecting those she truly cares about. Her way of coping with loss and helping others through loss is effectively a mix of spite, anger, and humor. 
For the sake of time, we'll be talking about the split in Astoria's role as the carer and Emir's role as the protector a whole bunch more with their snowy adventures, so keep this in mind for now. But point is, she is trying to help Connie here, not belittle him. Especially because, I mean, she knows that people can be turned into titans. She literally saw it firsthand and was transformed herself, right? And that is also exactly what our good friend and great leader Reiner asks him year later on, asking her whether she was trying to distract him from what happened to his family. And again, notice how Amir does not respond, she doesn't say a word. Fundamentally, she is a protector and she's not going to say a single word about it. She does what she needs to do and that is the end of that. She doesn't expect any fanfare, she's not even going to mention it, it's just what she does. Though in a classic case of overanalyzing, I also think that this is some doublespeak here. Because to us as the audience, all of this is a mystery, right? We don't know what happened at Ragako, but both Reiner and Emir, I think, are fully aware of what happened. I mean, again, Emir saw regular people turn into titans firsthand, and everything she heard lines up with exactly that. Not a drop of blood, everyone's missing, and the buildings are all destroyed. So yes, Reiner here saying, I don't want him to think about that, isn't a, oh, I don't want him to think about what potentially happened. It is, I don't want him to think about the deaths of his parents. Though that pales in comparison to the next sequence, because Amir then pulls out a can of herring. Then saying that it's not our favorite, but that it would do. Immediately gulping as the cold realization of what she just said sets in. Though without thoughts, Reiner just grabs the can and says, Oh, so the food here is canned? And then two immediately gulps as he realizes this is Marley in text, the food is canned, and she just mentioned herring, absolutely none of which should exist on parody. Even before the whole canon language debacle, the question Reiner should have asked is, what even is herring? Herring is a saltwater fish, neither one of them should know what that even is, let alone it being in a can, something that parody can't produce, and with Marley and text that Emir should not be able to read. And once again, in like 20 seconds flat, both realize that they've just exposed themselves, with that now familiar music hinting at Reiner's split in personality as he realizes this. Yumiru. This motif would of course be used in the famous wall sequence. The absolute climax of the constant back and forth between being a soldier and a warrior happening within Reiner's mind. <laughs> so in this case, he almost short circuits. I mean, try to put yourself in his shoes. To you, canned food is just an everyday thing, it just sort of exists. And then the person next to you also picks it up and without a second thought, describes it as totally normal. If this were a Paradisian immediately asking, what even is this thing, Reiner would have obviously adapted on the fly and also acted as if he has no clue. But in this case, just how casual Emir is about it, I mean, she has her guy doing a double take. In classic Attack on Titan fashion, we don't even get the time to see the sequence through, as all of them are suddenly called on with Titans once again swarming the castle. And so with that, we have now caught up to where we were before. First off, notice how even in a situation like this, they still talk about tracking their kills. Something that we've already heard is a constant badge of honor they carry around. With Aaron naming off their KD ratios as if he met his favorite Call of Duty team in 2010. Modern Warfare 1, 2, and 3 are still the best ones. Though secondly, and this is where things get really interesting, Line tells them to make a sort of a makeshift barrier to hold off the Titans. Prompting Reiner and Bertolt to immediately run ahead because one, they know they're the safest by default since, you know, Titan regeneration. And two, because they've just had so, so much more experience in a military hierarchy. I mean, sure, don't get me wrong. The others have very much had their trial by fire as well. But with Reiner and Bertolt, the warrior unit put them through quite the ringer years before they ever joined the cadets, so orders to them are far more life and death than they were to the rest of the soldiers. I mean, you remember when Aaron was a kid and Shigan Shinafel? Well, yeah, Shigan Shinafel because of Reiner and Bertolt already being warriors, right? But the absolute best part here has to be the transition we see from Reiner's perspective, with us fading from the present day to all the way back when Marcel was eaten by Amir. Purely visually, it's just really, really cool. But in story, it achieves a whole bunch of different things at once. Firstly, in many ways, this is Reiner's breaking point. His first proper dance with death that quickly makes him question whether or not continuing to pursue their mission of finding the founder really is the right call. Luckily for us, we wouldn't have to wait long to see what his decision was. Though secondly, it gives a full body shot of what we now know to be Amir's Titan. 
which of course opens a whole nother can of worms, particularly if you enjoy overanalyzing. In hindsight, we of course know that this is where she got the Jaw Titan in the first place. Though currently, we are of course completely unaware of the fact that the power is stolen through eating another shifter. That said though, note how in the flashback her teeth was flat, while now they are rigid. And same goes for the nails. In the flashback, they appear to be totally normal like any other pure titan. But now, they are rigid, almost like claws. So while yes, jumping to the conclusion that eating some rando we know literally nothing about gave her the shifter power is certainly a major leap, it is also hard to deny that there aren't any clues there, right? Also, I know that some have wondered about why her pure titan form appears to be basically the same as her shifter form. And here, I think there are a few possible answers. First off, the super obvious and boring one is just that it's a practical way of hinting at Emir's origin and giving us a concrete, recognizable link between her and Reiner. So if nothing more, then yes, this is literally for us as the audience to be able to recognize this as Emir. Though an in-universe explanation that I would propose is also relatively straightforward. I would say that it's not her pure Titan form that looks like her shifter form. It's that her shifter form looks like her normal one. Keep in mind, we have seen Titans running around on all fours. And we have also seen Marley pick certain people for certain Titans. So while we can't say for sure, perhaps there are some fundamental characteristics that can be used to determine how well a particular shifter will drive with their Titan form. Peak's human body, for example, actually changes because of how long she spends in her Titan form, with her having to go through what is basically physical therapy to learn to walk again. Also, unlike the Colossal Titan, for example, that was a complete visual overhaul, with the Jaw Titan, we know that it inherits many of the characteristics of its wielder. With Amir's jaw, her hair is messy black locks, while with Galliard, it is swept back blonde hair. But yes, point is, even though we can't quite say that Marcel here is the original holder of the jaw, splicing in this scene here is certainly a bold move considering how much it actually shows. And before you ask, yes, I did go frame by frame and they weren't quite bold enough to show Annie here, because, you know, that would straight up reveal, like, literally everything. But anyway, cutting back to the present, Berthold pops up and immediately asks whether Reiner is okay. Which to me, seems like another case of doublespeak, with Berthold more so asking which version of Reiner he's currently talking to. Something that I think is further proven by Reiner then saying that he's fine and promising that they'll make it home. Something that would normally be a very, very odd thing to say, since, you know, why would he suddenly talk about home while fighting for his life? But in retrospect, clearly he is just showing that he's in his warrior persona and is referring to Marley. Though the rest of the squad then casually rolls a cannon on top of the Titan, and that is the end of that for now. And before we pick back up with them, we jump on over to the eye catchers talking about the history of Utgard Castle. And while that is cool and all, let me give you an even cooler bonus fact. In Norse mythology, Utgard is the stronghold of the giants. So with Z camping out here and later summoning a whole bunch of giants, it's just a neat extra layer of lore that, again, should make you even more suspicious about Ymir's name that now seems to be linked with Reiner as well. Returning to the episode though, the Titan soon gets back up and our boy Reiner gets his arm chomped. Though yet again, we have a whole bunch of things to mention right off the bat. Him jumping in to save Connie, I think can be viewed from both his warrior and soldier perspectives. Purely practically speaking, again, he's a titan shifter, so compared to Connie, he'll just be completely fine. Though from his soldier perspective, it is that leadership quality we've already heard a ton about. Keep this in mind for a moment. But being the mega chad that he is, he then literally carries the titan to the window, getting ready to jump out. Which again, even with the benefit of hindsight, makes you question which version of Reiner are we currently dealing with. The warrior Reiner can turn into a titan and be completely fine. The soldier Reiner, however, is ready to sacrifice himself for his allies. And all of that is exemplified in the very next sequence. They of course end up cutting the titan's jaw and everything's fine. And we then see Astoria once again fall into our Kara role and immediately bandage up Reiner. Even when ripping her own skirt, instead of saying that it's the best they have or anything like that, rather, she apologizes that it's apparently not clean enough. At this point, her character is exclusively a carer with no regard for herself. Something that would be even further shown with her ever-strengthening martyrdom throughout the following episode and even more so in Season 3. Also, the scene of Amir being just a tad bit thirsty saying that she also has a scratch on her finger still gives me the giggles every single time. Though we then get to what is probably the most important throwaway line we get in Utgard. 
Connie casually mentions that, oh, Reiner and even Annie constantly helped him and that without them, he'd probably be long dead. First off, it depicts the true morality behind the Marley soldiers. Because if they truly did not care, surely they would have never even bothered protecting Connie, right? Even if they were obsessed with not breaking cover, surely others would understand if they didn't intentionally sacrifice their own well-being for Connie. But still, they chose to do that. So again, just like we saw in the opening, the heart beating inside all of them. Though secondly, lumping in Reiner and Annie here, who, don't forget, we now know for an absolute fact to be a titan shifter and technically an enemy, it also depicts the morality of the Paradis soldiers and how, even now, they still just see them as fellow humans. Also subtly planting the idea that Reiner and Annie are just about one and the same. Because, you know, they are. They're the Marley Squad. Though far, far more importantly, Reiner casually throws out that this is just what it means to be a soldier, prompting Connie to ask Bertolt whether this is how he's always been. To which he responds by saying, No, Reiner used to be a dot 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 a warrior. You know who else said that? Yep, Annie literally seconds before he captured her. And no, it's not over just yet, because Reiner then goes all in and asks, What do you mean, I was a warrior? Because just like that, we are right back to parody Soldier Reiner and the sudden mention of a warrior is like almost a sleeper agent-like phrase that briefly snaps him back to being the Armor Titan. That ambient, ever so slightly uneasy music perfectly capturing that split in Reiner we'd now be seeing on full display. In the old days, Reiner was more of a warrior. Though unfortunately for our soldiers, everyone's favorite baseball enjoyer monkey pops off yet again and so we enter the final chapter of this episode. The scouts all rain down on the titans and we of course get about 300 more incredible ODM gear scenes. But what I more so want to talk about are the death scenes of Gelgar and Nanaba. Jesus, that transition sounded a lot more gruesome than I meant it to. We see Gelgar and Nanaba briefly mention their whole titan slaying statistics again. But Gelgar seems to be in a bit of a fog, with him just saying, I think I've banged up my head. And he then loses consciousness and simply falls into the titans below. It's not some 0 to 100 death like Mikkei or anything. He simply got what is probably a concussion and just passes out. It is just utterly hopeless more than anything else. And that's not even all, because Nanaba actually saves him. But even then, he tries taking that drink he so desperately wanted, but there is none left. And he is then yoinked by another titan. Yes, Isoyama really chose violence there. And you know where else he chose violence? With Nanaba literally screaming at the top of her lungs about how she's sorry and begging for her dad. Please, I'm sorry, Daddy! I'll be a good girl from now on, I'm right. Like, sheesh! Though as Historia begins to say how, oh, if only I had a weapon, Emir then steps in and spells out exactly what we just talked about. Historia is obsessed with constantly caring for others, she doesn't value herself at all, and she just wants to go out in some blaze of glory. Though here, the situation isn't quite as simple as it is with Connie. Sure, Emir is once again being rude and brash because ultimately she wants to protect her, but this time around, because we know they have that much deeper bond, there is a lot more truth in what she's saying. She knows Astoria better than anyone, so as much as she is being rude, she also fully realizes that this might truly be her last opportunity to tell her what she truly wants. Telling her to keep the promise they made back on that mountain of finally living the life she was meant to live. It's a somewhat paradoxical exchange between two people who are both wanting to sacrifice themselves for the other. And in what is both a very sad juxtaposition, as well as a bit of cheeky foreshadowing considering the importance of Historia's name, Call Your Name fades into the background as Emir leaps off. And with that, let us jump right into episode 30, which too has no opening sequence and moves right into the title, that being Historia. Yeah, well, it's called that because this episode is about Historia and she reveals her name, Historia. In case you don't fully understand it, don't worry about it, I know it's very, very deep and complex. Moving into the episode itself, we open with what is just about the only time in the series that we see snow, and frankly, that is a goddamn travesty. Look, I know most anime usually try to aim for spring or summer for the thirsty thirsty boys for what I think are obvious reasons, but can we please get some cozy Christmas vibes in anime? The winter time is the best time of year and it's frankly not even close. That said though, these winter missions are also really cool from a lore perspective. As I mentioned with the coffee, it very much confirms that we are in fact in a part of the world that has all four seasons. 
Not only that, it also depicts the passage of time that can often feel somewhat overlooked in many series. By showing us the winter time and us now operating in the summer time, I mean, obviously there's a bunch of time in between, right? And also, it explores a completely different angle to survival, with ODM gear being completely off the table for now, and them rather training sheer endurance. And let me make a rare exception, as we'd also get a mid-card talking about the other advantage of traveling during the winter time. As we already know, Titans are largely powered by sunlight, meaning that blizzards and just longer nights in general obviously hinder their abilities quite a bit, suddenly making a blizzard a surprisingly advantageous time for training. It sort of flips your expectations upside down of, oh, a blizzard should be the most dangerous time just because of the elements, right? But in this case, it is actually among the safest because the Titan threat should be minimal. Though in story, we hear Reiner pop up and say that Astoria, or still Krista, is missing, so again, we are very much dealing with the soldier Reiner here. And to further cement that sense of a long time having passed since this happened, Marco too then pops up, because, you know, he isn't really around anymore. And of course, with the benefit of hindsight, this also implies that the promise of Astoria and Amir isn't something from last Tuesday, but rather a far, far longer spanning promise implying a much deeper bond. Another interesting thing to note here is how the series subverts the whole oh we'll be heroes and go save our friends trope. They are all told that they would go out searching for them, but that they only do it in the morning. Saying that if they went out now, all of them would just end up dying and no one would be saving either Astoria or Amir. This naturally brings up the classic quandary. Rationally, you probably know that you shouldn't go out searching, right? But at the same time, I mean, even the tiniest sliver of empathy will clearly push you to just do something, right? Just sitting around while your friend is fighting for their life? Of course, no matter how irrational, you would want to do something, not just sit around. But in this case, as much as they'd all want to go after her, which we'll get to in a bit, they ultimately wouldn't even have to, as they just show up by themselves. Though practically, it just avoids the silliness that would transpire with all of them heading out into what is certain death, but miraculously all ending up fine. So by doing this, it still conveys their personalities with them wanting to go save her, while also not falling for the silly hero pitfall that would require some creative writing to make sure that they somehow all end up alive. Though we then jump on over to our missing trio, where Astoria and Amir once again fall right back into their usual roles. Emir tells Astoria to leave Daz behind, saying that he should have known what he was signing up for, and that the only way Astoria would make it out of this alive was if they dropped the dead weight. So again, she's a protector. She wants Astoria to become stronger because she wants her to survive. She wants Astoria to leave Daz behind because she wants her to live for herself. So figuratively, she wants Astoria to leave the dead weight behind, that being Daz, or her name Krista, and then make it out on her own and live her own life as Astoria. Historia, on the other hand, is the obsessive carer, with her just saying that, absolutely no, I am not leaving him behind no matter what. And it's then that we see the same exact dynamic we saw in Utgard, with Amir calling out Historia for her martyrdom and then dropping the bombshell. She says that she's heard the rumors about her being important to the church, though also promising that she won't say a word. Naturally, Historia asks why she did all of this and why she didn't try to expose her, to which Amir responds by saying that she's not sure herself saying, maybe we just have more in common than I thought. With the benefit of hindsight, we of course know that to be very true, with Amir's entire life being hinged on playing the role of a false queen and a false deity, while Astoria is the complete opposite, playing a nobody while in reality she's a royal. Both lived a life of lies and both resented themselves for that. That is, until they met each other. As you're well aware though, Attack on Titan is very depressing, so we all know how that ended. Though yes, Emir then tells Astoria that her dying here would be doing exactly what they want, effectively telling her to keep living if only just to literally spite them. And she then tosses her down the hill, saying that she would be dealing with Daz. And as soon as Astoria is gone, she transforms and then gets Daz out of here. Which importantly, tells us that despite her immense trust in Astoria, she never actually revealed her form. And hold this thought for now. Though because she transforms here, many people have asked, well, where's the lightning and where's the noise? Well, I think that's exactly why this happened during a blizzard, after we saw Historia roll down a hill and get covered in snow. Because we are following Historia as the narrator here, it's as simple as her being a little preoccupied and simply not noticing it. Probably just writing off the transformation to her being buried by that pile of snow. 
Someone who does notice it, however, is Aaron and the others, who were seconds away from going out to search for them, only to notice a sudden loud bang in the distance. And big surprise, as they emerge from the house, they see Amir walking up with Daz. So yeah, I just write down the lack of noise and visibility of any lightning to us being in a pretty serious blizzard. Though with that, we jump back on over to Astoria, who finally makes it back, where we also see Amir, who has stayed up until literal dawn, out in the cold, in the snow, waiting for Astoria. So yes, Emir is pretty serious about this whole thing. Naturally, Historia just asks how she made it down so fast. To which Emir says she is fine with sharing her secret, so long as Historia promises to put on Barry the Light on her MP3 player, become reclaimer of her name, and live the life she was meant to. Sorry, I could not resist. Though very importantly, they never actually share their secrets. Historia never tells her her true name, and Amir never reveals her titan. It is purely a promise that, one day, they would share it with each other. And as they do, a literal new dawn rises on Paradis, with Historia, the true queen, now being just a step closer to reclaiming her name. Which then fades right back into Utgard, where that dawn has finally arrived. And we then get this absolutely beautiful shot from Amir's perspective, with us seeing the picturesque skies and clouds above, them almost resembling cotton candy. And amongst all of that stands Astoria, simply stretching out her hands. And with that, you see Big Girl plays as Amir finally pops off. Though very importantly, in this case, we have yet another instance of some serious duality, because both Amir and Astoria are now becoming reclaimers of their name. Emir transforming here finally reveals her true self, which by their promise, immediately also leads into Astoria also revealing her true name. So just like we saw with Sasha and her trip back home, and countless others that we're still yet to see, both are now accepting their past and are truly living in the present. And also, also, if you want to overanalyze, considering all the Norse stuff we've already seen, Emir reclaiming her name is a bit of a red flag, you know? Because like, who is she reclaiming it from? Again, in Norse, the world of humans itself is made out of Emir, right? But okay, let's not open that can of worms yet. And naturally, as soon as she transforms, both Reiner and Burrito remember the day and immediately recognize Emir's titan form. And man, do I love that moment of complete rage we see within them. I mean, Reiner is just short-circuiting here, with him catching Astoria but squeezing her leg so hard that she cries out about him hurting her. There is now a perpetual war in his mind of, what do we do now? We came here, we lost the jaw even before we started our mission. But now finally, we found it and we know Eren has the attack titan. Should we capture Amir and Eren and just return home right now? Keep in mind that at this point, he still thinks Annie is completely fine. He doesn't know she's already been captured. All of these questions and hypotheticals are just racing through his mind and, as we know, we are a mere few hours away from all of that blowing up. Though with Amir, I think that same Annie chase music popping up here is an excellent choice. It's just pure chaotic dissonance with these overbearing and intense pulses over and over. <laughs> And to further cement the bond between Historia and Amir, we see the shot of Amir, even in her absolutely monstrous form, just helplessly extending out her arm toward Historia, who, without a second's thoughts, accepts her immediately. For her, this is very much a Mikasa and Eren situation. If Amir is in there, it doesn't matter that it's a Titan, that is just Amir, pure and simple. For her, there is no reason to be scared. She knows Emir, and therefore she knows this Titan. Though the absolute best part here is them realizing that Emir is not going all out because she doesn't want to risk the tower falling over. Which is when Historia steps up on the ledge and, if not word for word, then very very close to it, repeats exactly what Emir told her. Calling her an idiot for trying to be a hero going out in a blaze of glory, calling her selfish for going out like this, etc etc with her finally just screaming, take out the tower. And with that, Emir very much has a yes my queen moment as she just tears it down brick by brick, with it almost immediately tipping over and also giving us what is easily among the cheekiest scenes of all time. Naturally, most of us would be hyped by the wholesome moments between Historia and Emir and the huge climax of yet another shifter entering the fray. But in classic AOT fashion, we have Bear Tolt in the background who is seconds away from biting his hand and transforming. 
So yeah, we have an alternate universe where the whole tower is immediately eviscerated by his transformation, so that's fun I guess. Though despite the huge hype, it's not long until Amir is knocked to the ground and moments later, torn limb from limb. With Astoria just calling out that she still hasn't told her her real name. And suddenly, when a titan appears and is seconds away from grabbing her, that martyrdom is gone, with her simply repeating the same words, I still haven't told you my name. I know I'm weird about these things, but I absolutely love seeing these sorts of very simple and trivial pursuits that transcend what you normally do. I mean, she just wants to say her name, right? It's not that deep. But to her, it is. She and Amir made a promise to each other, and now that Amir is transformed, she needs to hold up her end of the bargain. And so, she doesn't scream in horror, she doesn't scream for help. She simply says, Wait, we made a promise, I still need to tell you my name. The sheer simplicity of it just makes it really powerful for me. Sort of like we've already seen with just those don't die type of scenes. It's nothing deep, it's nothing profound, it is literally just don't die. Something about that hits really really hard, just like with Astoria here. Though luckily, Mikasa and the other scouts all pop off and quickly dispatch all the other titans. And let's be honest here, all of us were covered in goosebumps as they just appear as this swarm in the sky, just carving up all the titans in the space of a few seconds. Also also, I have a wacky goofy fact for you. This is Eren's first and just about the only titan kill with ODM gear. Obviously he racked up a whole bunch of kills in Trost with his titan, but ODM gear wise, he is really not that flashy. Though to be fair, he did get the killing blow on the Colossal, so I guess that makes up for it. But with the fight finally over, we linger on the very heavily injured Emir who awakens for just a moment. Seeing Historia's face, who finally holds up her end of the deal, revealing her true name. And seconds later, Emir falls back asleep, now with a smile. Though wholesomeness times aside though, we have to remember that Hanji and the others discussed exactly this just a few episodes ago. And Hanji knows of Emir's name from Isle's notebook. So at this point, this confirms seemingly everything. Istoria revealing her name obviously confirms what Nick said about her importance. And while the Emir stuff Hanji read in Isle's notebook isn't quite about this Emir, as of right now, Hanji has every reason to believe that Emir is very, very important as well. And on that surprisingly wholesome note, those are episodes 29 and 30, my voice is almost gone. Not only that, unfortunately, this wholesomeness will not last, as the rest of the season is kinda sorta all about forever separating Amir and Astoria. You know, that's not very wholesome. Jokes aside though, now that we've uncovered the jaw and Aaron just so happens to be here as well, our boy Reiner is about to surprise us with his next move in what I still believe to be one of, if not the greatest reveals in the series. So that said, I hope to see you back as we go full pedal to the metal in the Titan's clashing arc and continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Future Kuroto popping in here to tell you that I recorded the next video during a thunderstorm, so the Rhino reveal might have some serious 4D immersion. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Fairy Cruz and Patches Ojo. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.